that we're doing on people joining. We've got 36 participants. Let's see. Let's see who the attendees. All right, well, I think I think we have a good enough amount of attendees to get started. Yeah. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Kerwin. I am the now we're doing on people joining. We've got 36 participants. Oh, you know, hold on. My YouTube is, is, uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think we have a good enough. See, first time you do this, you learn that when you have YouTube on, you end up getting both things. So turn that off. All right, <laughs> starting. Um, I'm Amy Kerwin. I'm the artistic director at Southampton Art Center. And thank you all for joining us this evening for the ripple effect, small actions impacting larger scale change which is moderated by one of SAC's wonderful board members, Susan Rockefeller. Thank you, Susan. Um, I also want to thank our panelists, Nicole Delma, Barley Dunn, and Carl Safina. Um, so before I turn it over to Susan, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, when we get started, I'll disappear and Susan will take over. I'll be monitoring the Q&A and chat field and will select a few questions to be addressed after the conversation. I will then not so magically reappear to pose some of your questions to the panel. We would like to keep this to an hour, so I apologize in advance for not being able to get to all of your questions, but I'll save them and I'll share them with the panelists in order to email responses to everyone later. Now a little bit about Susan Rockefeller, our mod moderator. Um, in addition to Southampton Arts Centers, she also sits on the boards of Oceana and Stone Barns Center for Food and Agriculture. Susan is an avid lover of the East End. She is interested in health soul, healthy souls and healthy seeds. She is the founder of Musings, a digital magazine on responsible innovation and ideas and action for a better world. So check that out on musingsmagazine.com. Okay, Susan, I am gonna take, I'm gonna try to disappear. I'm gonna let you take it away. And again, Excellent. people can pose their questions in the Q&A and we, I will monitor them, so, okay. So good evening, everybody. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. And I just wanted to clarify I am passionate about healthy soils, soils. For regenerative agriculture and healthy oceans. So also <laughs> souls, because I think it's Sorry. all connected. But um, anyway, I uh, wanted to thank you, Amy, and the Southampton Arts Center. And I couldn't have a better group of panelists to explore the topic of the ripple effect. And I'd also just want to applaud what the Southampton Arts Center does for bringing together this community of fellow human beings to re-examine our relationship with nature and our relationship with each other. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge, as we all know, that we are living in extraordinary times with COVID-19 and the movement to rise up and re-examine and fight for a more just world. We're also aware as conservationists and activists of the connection between racism and social injustice by the air, water, and other toxins disproportionately found in lower income and black neighborhoods. And part of our work, I believe, as innovators and writers and artists and educators and scientists and human beings is to understand and be part of a collective movement for justice. Um, my husband and I have a motto to protect what is precious, which has three pillars, family, art, and nature. And the East End, to me, celebrates these values. And so do the panelists that we have here tonight. Our global family is in need of healing. And what better way to think about making a difference than to think about the ripple effect and the work that we can all do together. So I am honored to be in conversation with these panelists tonight and with the Southampton Arts community. The format will be to start by my introducing and asking each panelist a question specific to their career and then move to sort of a shorter snappier Q&A with time for audience participation. So please write in your questions to the chat room and then Amy will be fielding them and, and asking them to the panelists later on in the evening. So I'm going to start off with Nicole. Hello, Nicole. It's so good to see you. You too. You too. <laughs> Nicole is the founder of Fawn Group Consulting, where she works with brands focused on brand growth while maximizing cause impact. 
Nicole's newest, newest initiative, change.org petition is asking Amazon and other major retailers to offer plastic free packaging options at checkout has gained, and this is amazing, has gained over 350,000 signatures, is earning backing from state legislators and is working with Oceana on a major international campaign to get Amazon to change its packaging practices offer plastic free options and lift the plastic requirements on its marketplace vendors. Thank you, Nicole, for doing that. Nicole is also founder of the Air, Land and Sea Environmental Film category of the Hampton Film Festival and is locally active in all projects that are eco art related. Nicole has most recently launched mindoffline.org to help reconnect people with their offline selves through education workshops and at home maker kits. Nicole lives in Sag Harbor with her husband and their two adorable children. They are avid surfers and love the nature and community of the East End. So Nicole, it's great to see you and congratulations on gaining traction with this plastic pollution initiative. And I would love you to share with the community online tonight, what inspired you to start the petition what was it about the specific wording in this, peti this petition that you think caused it to go viral uh, when so many of these plastic petitions against Amazon and other large marketplace sellers have not? They just kind of go dead in the water. And what are the next steps for the movement for plastic-free online checkout? Thank you so much, Sue. Um, and thank you, Amy, also for the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, the motivation for the petition, I think, came from many years. I, I've had a background in digital marketing. I used to work at J. Crew and Condé Nast and spent a lot of time in the checkout. So that was always top of mind. Um, and knowing that that was an area that businesses spent a lot of time focusing on, um, directly connected to their bottom line, and was designed to be an area you know, to make it easier for consumers to have a better user experience. And that, coupled with my concern about uh, the plastics issue, I just kept noodling on the idea that there's got to be an easier way that everybody can agree to. And I think that that was the, the key part of the petition is that rather than asking anyone to ban plastic, taking that right away from someone, um, we instead asked Amazon to just make it a choice because you already have so many different choices at checkout about how many packages you get with which uh, type of delivery they're going to be delivered um, and how many boxes. Um, that we, we felt like this is just something that should be a right. It's something that we had in the store. And now that Doorfront is essentially the new storefront and even more so with COVID, uh, we just found a really uh, positive response from people where they felt like I'm being forced to order more online, either because of my lifestyle or because of other limitations. Um, you know, a lot of people prior to COVID that had disabilities or worked long hours or had children at home um, or lived in areas even like the Hamptons find it hard to get to the store for certain basics or find it hard to find competitive pricing. Um, so we, we put it up with some very simple language and I honestly did it after a paddle with uh, Gina Davis, who's one, um, you know, who's uh, also an Oceana supporter. Um, and, or Gina Bradley, apologies, <laughs> and um, I'd like to paddle with Gina Davis too, that would be great, but with <laughs> Gina Bradley, um, and expected to get a thousand signatures, and I went on a trip to Costa Rica shortly after that, and a friend that was with me said, did you, did you know it's at 50,000, um, and that was like the first aha moment, um, and then it quickly climbed to 150,000, and today we actually hit 370,000, um, and that, that's, you know, before we, we started getting the support with from Oceana, which is going to um, happen in the next several weeks, which will absolutely magnify. Um, they already helped us to get the petition translated into six different languages and we're working on others. Um, we're, they're putting in the hard work to do the research, to talk to consumers, to talk to um, those that experience the marketplace restrictions where Amazon actually has what's called a bubble wrap non-compliance um, penalty, where if you don't, if you're a seller on the marketplace and many sellers are now forced to sell on Amazon um, as their primary means or only means of, of interacting with the public, uh, they actually get dinged if they don't use enough plastic bubble wrap. So we're just ask, asking them to expand that definition and then use their massive logistics capability to solve for this issue. Um, and it's, it's not to say that we think that cardboard waste is um, okay in the amounts that we're producing it either. 
um, we just realized that the plastic waste in particular is very problematic. It's very problematic on Long Island because we don't have access to facilities that can properly manage it. Many of the recycling facilities are no longer um, operable because there's just not a market. And then the plastic, when it does enter those facilities actually clogs them up and slows down the, the, the rate at which they can recycle regular materials. So um, I think the, the viral nature had a lot to do with um, the way that people are thinking now. Yes, I'd like to check that button. Yes, I'd like to have that option. And, and why does that not exist yet online? Well, thank you. I am thrilled that Oceana is partnered with your initiative and there is so much interest in the plastic pollution issue and, and the outrage that uh, in our lifetime, we might see the extinction of marine mammals due to you know it's ocean acidification, but it's also the amount of plastic um, that is choking and, and killing marine mammals and sea life. So. Um, we're thrilled to be part of it and, and thank you for your great work and your innovation and creativity. Uh, I'd like to now transition to the next panelist. I'd like to introduce John Barley Dunn, but known as Barley. I love your name. It's fabulous. Um, Barley received a bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife biology from the University of Vermont in 1995. He spent three years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Solomon Islands, where he and his wife worked on a black lip pearl oyster research project where they conducted the first seeding for black pearls in Solomon Islands. John then received a master's degree in fisheries and aquaculture and took a job at the town of Islip Shellfish Culture Facility, where he worked as an algae culturist. John has been working at the East Hampton Shellfish Hatcheries since 2004 and took over as director of the operation in 2011. Along with his work with East Hampton Shellfish Hatchery, he assists a nonprofit called Conscious Point Shellfish Company, is chair of the Long Island Shellfish Managers Group and is secretary of the Long Island Oyster Growers Association. I want to say that's quite a like she sells seashells by the sea shrubbers. It's quite a tongue twister. But um, I want to thank you, Barley, for your great work in literally, you know, receding the culture of oystering on the East End. And I'd love to have you share with us how you got into oystering. And was it more for the utility or the environmental impact or both? And how would someone go about learning the trade and getting their own oyster garden going? And most of all, um, and hopefully for the listeners, when will you open or do you have a pickup in place for those who want those delicious oysters? Good question. So you alluded to what got me into it. Really what got me into it was the, I have prop black lip pearl oyster, this beautiful shellfish here that creates the black pearl um down there in the solomon islands um that was my really my first look at shellfish and that was like you said over 20 years ago and i've been really hooked on shellfish ever since they're really very rewarding to grow and couple that with the fact that they're low trophic level animals that are very utilitarian they're great filter feeders they're they provide habit provide habitat themselves as well as the gear that we grow them in so it's uh, just an all around really rewarding animal. Of course, they're great to eat also. So um, after leaving Solomon's, I just continued and it's been pure shellfish all the way ever since. And uh, you know, 20 plus years in, I every year growing a new crop, I'm still um, enamored by these animals, just watching them under the microscope as larvae developing into juvenile spat with their little feet, hopping around, jumping, literally flopping around. Um, and then as they set and, and mature to the point where we can eat them on our plate, just knowing that all the while that they're growing, they're providing this great facility of filtering the water, uh, providing habitat and food for us, food for other animals. Uh, it's, it's just been really rewarding. And like I said, 20 years in and I'm, I'm it's really the, the novelty hasn't worn off. Um, so I think really it's, it's a combination of everything. I like to eat them. I really appreciate their, their ecological duties. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an aquaculture fundamentalist by any, by any means. There are many forms of aquaculture that 
um, need a lot of work, some which possibly could be eliminated uh, for environmental effects and ecological effects, but working with these low trophic animals is, it, to me, it's most the most rewarding work that there is really. Um, as far as getting in, involved, I think the oyster gardening programs that we as well as Cornell Cooperative Extension run, um, we have gardens all throughout East Hampton Town. Cornell has gardens up on the North Fork as well as in uh, Tiana Bay. And I also work with another nonprofit called South Fork Sea Farmers and we're trying to kind of, kind of fill this gap between North Fork and East Hampton. Um, as well as allowing people that have their own docks to grow oysters. So a lot of folks don't probably don't know that if you have a dock in mm -hmm. certified waters where you where you can shellfish, you can actually get a simple permit and uh, grow oysters off your own dock. So that's a great, great opportunity, very rewarding. And I mean, what's better than walking out in your own dock and grabbing some oysters for the evening, like on a, fr on a Friday night in May or June? Um, as, until then, the way to get oysters is a lot of, a lot of since COVID, a lot of the uh, oyster farms uh, on Long Island and the East End are actually offering delivery services. So um, I won't single any out for, for favoring any in, in particular, but there are a lot of farms that are, that are actually delivering oysters right to your door. You can get them whole or, or shocked. So that's a, a great way to get your hands on some oysters. Well, that sounds great. I, you know, we're up in Maine and we have a lot of friends that have their own oysters and they go out on their paddle boards and they collect them, you know, in, at dawn and at sunset. And it's amazing. It's a great way to observe nature. And, and so thank you. Um, and now to Carl Safina, who I'm going to embarrass you, Carl, but who is one of the smartest and most passionate people I know in the conservation movement. That's embarrassing. <laughs> so I am I'll honored. take it on a Friday night. <laughs> I am honored to introduce you, Carl. You are best known for your lyrical nonfiction writing about nature and conservation. And you explore how humans are changing the living world and what the changes mean for non-human beings and for us all. Your work fuses scientific understanding, emotional connection, and a moral call to action. Carl's writing has won, and I, I have to just say this, because it's just what a rock star, a MacArthur Book, Book Awards, Pew and Guggenheim, National Science Foundation Fellowships, and numerous book awards we could go on. Carl grew up raising pigeons, training hawks and owls, and spending as much time outside and on the water as he could. Carl has a PhD in ecology. He's been a passionate advocate working to ban high seas drift nets and to overhaul the US fishing policy. Carl is a professor at Stony Brook University and founding president of the Safina Center. I encourage everybody online to go to his website, carlsafina.org and safinacenter.org to learn about his writing and published books and his most recent book, Becoming Wild, How Animal Cultures Raise Families, Create Beauty and Achieve Peace. And I'm also gonna say sign up for his newsletter to stay in touch with all that Carl is doing because I get it and I love it. Carl lives on Long Island, New York with his wife, Patricia and their dogs and their feathered friends. So Carl, can you talk about your newest book, Becoming Wild, and what drew you to writing this book? And which of the three animals especially surprised you when doing the research on them? And what is the most important thing we can do as humans to understand non-human animals better? And finally, and this speaks to an article that I read uh, that, that you had from your center, what can COVID-19 teach us in relation to wild animals and our degrading ecosystems and biodiversity loss. Okay, well, uh, you said I was smart. I don't know if I'm smart enough to remember all of those questions, but let me try. Uh, first of all, the book is about animal cultures and uh, many people would think that culture is a strictly human thing. So let me explain what culture is. Culture is the things that you learn from your social group that get passed along socially. 
humans have a lot of culture. A lot of other animals have culture. A lot of other animals rely very heavily on learning from their social group how to live. To see the importance of that, just imagine taking something like a chimpanzee, raising it in captivity, bringing it to some wild place and opening the door. You, you know that it wouldn't know what to do and it would die. That's what would happen. And the difference is that a chimpanzee raised in nature would acquire all the culture of that chimpanzee community. And the same is true for quite a few other animals, actually a, an amazing array of animals once I, once I really got into it. The book focuses on chimps, sperm whales, and the big parrots called macaws. Sperm whales are really incredible and we should talk a little bit about whales because uh, we are having this discussion based out of the Southampton Art Center on the east end of Long Island. And we're very, very water oriented around here. Um, the sperm whales have a social organization that is almost identical to African elephants. Females stay together lifelong in family groups. Uh, the, the oldest female, her sisters, uh, their daughters and their babies. And then at adolescence, the males leave. They do something different. The reason that they have these, uh, this social structure, this female oriented social structure is that unlike other whales that will migrate to a place where there's no food, but also very few predators in order to give birth, and they won't eat for several months, and then they will migrate north like the humpback whales that are coming here now to where the food is with their baby trailing them. The sperm whales give birth where their food is, but the food is 2,000 feet down and the babies cannot go. So a baby sperm whale is helpless at the surface if killer whales show up or some other problem happens. And the entire social organization of sperm whales is basically a babysitting culture where sisters or aunts will stay with the baby while the mother dives. They dive for about 50 minutes out of every hour and they hunt squid a, a thousand or 2000 or more feet down where there's no light, uh, frigid temperatures and they hunt these squid using echolocation, sonar. So at the end of the 50 minutes or so, they will, they will come back up and then uh, somebody else will be with the baby. Maybe the mother will stay with the baby or nurse the baby and then the sister will then go down. But this entire sperm whale social organization is organized around babysitting. And the uh, other amazing things that come from that culturally is that each individual whale, well, think the ocean is a vast, vast place and these whales may be able to swim 50 miles a day. So if you're together with the same whales at the end of 10 or 20 years, that's not an accident. They're, they're, they're taking quite a lot of effort to stay together. And so they understand who they are by who they're with, which when you think about it is exactly like we are, like we do. We understand who we are because of who we are with and who we associate with. The whales have a way of announcing themselves as individuals, saying what family they belong to and saying what clan the family is in. And with many social animals that live in groups, the individual has to know all, of the, if it's a stable group, the individual has to know all the other individuals in the group. Sperm whales identify with a group, with a clan group, by these clicked patterns of codas. They're like Morse code. And they make these patterned clicks that say who I am, what family I'm with, and what clan I am with. Now, the really amazing thing is that they can identify whether another whale family is a member of their clan, in which case they will socialize with them, or a member of a different clan, in which case they will not socialize with them, they will avoid them. They know this even if the other whales are complete strangers because of the patterns of clicks that they learn culturally. And the only other animal known 
that can identify whether a total stranger is a member of their group is human beings. Sperm whales and human beings are the only two animals known that can come across individuals who are total strangers and know whether they're members of the same group and they can socialize or not. We have way, and, and group identification was thought to be uniquely human until a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago. We have, you know, um, team insignias, religious insignias, language itself is a cultural thing by which we understand if you're in my group or you're not in my group. And, and the sperm whales are like that as well. So why I, why I wanted to write this book is uh, I'm, I'm trying to help, um, you know, unlayer who we are in the world with, all these other kinds of creatures that most people, you know, maybe you've heard of sperm whales, almost nobody has seen sperm whales, they're very rare to see because they live off the continental shelf in very deep water, unlike the humpback whales that come right up and down the beach. So the opportunity to watch them and then to disentangle these uh, incredibly subtle nuances of these codes, you know, this takes decades of work and um, to just to try to communicate with people who we are here with in the world. The, these other creatures, they're not just out there moving around, not knowing what they're doing or doing everything by pure instinct. They, they know who they're with. They, they have lives, they value their lives, they value their family and their friends. And, uh, and I'm trying to show these things. So having said that, I forgot all the other questions you asked. Well, I, have, I just wanna say it's so beautiful because I do feel like the one thing that, um, I'm gonna bring this back to sort of the ripple effect and I, I will re-ask the other question to you, but um, with all of you and the work that you do, there is this sense of, being part of a larger community and it includes being empathetic, you know, to the birds and the bees and understanding the interconnections between the pollinators and our food and, um, you know, whether it's water and keeping our waters, you know, cleaner with filtration from bivalves and the work that Nicole's doing with, with the plastic pollution. And, and I guess, um, you know, I'm thinking about sort of you know, in a sense, what, um, I mean, I want to go back to Carl in terms of, you know, like, can you talk about COVID-19 and like what this is telling us? I mean, there was this sort of rewilding of animals that came back. Um, it wasn't that we've created this new bounty, but it did show that when we actually stop doing things, when the human uh, apparatus and machine of, of industry just pauses, you can see a rewilding of sorts and, um, and what COVID actually is teaching us in terms of the need for wild places and um, the need to try to protect more biodiversity. So um, I guess, you know, I'll move to the next question. I'd like you to answer that, but in the um, context of what gives you hope. So I'd like to start with Carl and you could talk about it in relation to the oceans or what needs to be done as we look at this new pandemic and new reality and, and also have Barley weigh in and, and Nicole as well. Yeah, well, about, about COVID, um, I think that, you know, the, the virus came from animals that we use for food. It, in this case, it seems almost certainly to have come from wild animals that we use for food. And these wild animals are, um, they become situated in these markets where they're up, up right against animals that they would not normally be in the same place with, e even in the same part of the world with um, bats and civets and all these other wild animals that, that find themselves in these really filthy, really miserable markets. And over the last 20 or 25 years, we've had an accelerating series of epidemics, most of them more deadly than COVID, but none of them escaped and became pandemic like COVID has. All of them, just think of the names of some of them, bird flu, that's from poultry, swine flu mm -hmm. from pig farms, Ebola came from people eating 
uh, certain kinds of monkeys and apes in Africa. And these, these viruses um, live within these wild animal hosts. They, they've been with them so long that they don't cause any illness at all in those animals. Uh, just like many of the things that we carry don't cause illness in us. And if you can you know, think back to uh, some basic history lessons, when Europeans came to the new world, the, the diseases of Europeans that they could live with wiped out 90% of the natives, often, often before they ever saw a white face. This is now happening to us because of really our broken relationship with the rest of the living world going deeper and farther into nature to scour the, whatever we can eat, bringing it back, getting infected with these viruses that are mutating a little bit and finding a great new market share, 7 billion new things that they can infect called human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, the, you know, the fact is all of those markets and all of these farms that are so concentrated, these factory farms especially, they're all accelerating in their intensification of how we treat the rest of the living world. And um, it's, it's now turning deadly for us. The, and the, the sort of the unthinking cruelty and brutality with which we treat all of these animals has an echo in the unthinking brutality with which we treat other people. The, the fact that we have a pandemic and all of this civil unrest going on right now are, are related. They're related to the fact that we are running a, a major and very dangerous and now deadly on all fronts, empathy deficit. Now, what gives me hope is that we can recognize these things and we can talk about them. Absolutely. We don't, it's not that we don't have any idea what caused the problems or what's going on. We know exactly and we can talk about them. And my definition of hope, it's not just something you wish for. Hope is the ability to see how something can get better. So That's hope, in, in that sense, hope motivates all work. And we have a lot of work to do, but we understand a lot about what the problems are. And, uh, and that's, that's the path forward with that. And the other thing is, you know, implicit in the idea of what hope you have or do you have hope is, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And, and I, I don't think it's worth time on, on that question. I, I think the question is, are we doing the right things? Absolutely. I'd like to ask, um, I so agree with you. I think that we have a real empathy deficit um, and gratitude deficit in this world. And um, I keep in this, in this time of reflection, it's really what keeps coming up is do less harm, you know, do less harm. And, you know, whether it's, you know, I've read some great books like um, we are the weather, the Jonathan Safran Foer book, you know, climate change begins at breakfast and the way of gratitude by Galen Gingrich, who's actually an East Ender with a home on Shelter Island. And, and I don't, if anyone has not read that book, it's a great inspirational book on the power of gratitude to transform us as a daily practice of understanding our interconnectedness to each other and all nature. And I think that is critical. I'd love, I'd love Nicole to talk a bit about um, Mind Offline, which I really think, you know, is a, a movement from consumption to creativity. So if you just want to say a few words about that initiative and, and what and how you created that in this time of sheltering in. Sure, Susan. Um, and and I, I completely agree with what Carl said as well. And I, I also like to try to err on the side of optimism because I, I think the worst thing we can do when we're overwhelmed with these massive scale um, you know, changes and threats is, is to sit idle. And so it, my first company was formed in the wake of Hurricane Sandy and this next initiative, you know, really kind of started at, at the very beginning of COVID, but um, it had been something I'd been thinking about for a while. Um, and it taps into human culture and human nature. And that I have a belief that has proven true for me that 
all of this use of our hands as a human race uh, without a product to show for it is going against our, our DNA, is going against our constitution, that we were able to thrive as a species because we were able to adapt with our opposable thumbs. We were able to create tools to fish and um, live by the sea and you know the same technology that allowed us to thrive in times where we otherwise might have starved um, you know, is now challenging us because we're continuing to push for more convenience, 24 hour connectivity and at what cost? At what cost are you willing to um, give away all of your autonomy um, to have that connectivity and have other people be able to access you whenever and however they want to? Um, and so Mind Offline was an initiative that was initially supposed to launch offline. <laughs> you know, I wanted to do it in August and uh, with as minimal internet or um, social media presence as, as possible, although I realized those things are necessary. Um, and we pivoted very quickly um, when I realized a couple things. You know, one, suddenly people were stuck at home and um, schools, you know, my children at the time were two and four and they were being asked to, to log online for classwork. And um, that just didn't feel right to me. And I understand that that was the only choice that schools had, but um, that made me sad to think that they would be put online when they have the rest of their life to have to be online. Um, and that people really needed to connect with, with these activities. And it's not just about the time you spend offline, but um, what we're really trying to do is get people reconnected with the maker creator nature that that is within them and that is so much a part of humanity whether you consider yourself a creative or not when you you know ideate something and then collect the materials that you need to to realize that vision and then perfect your skill set and actually produce something and you go back and look at your work there's a profound satisfaction um, physiologically there's a release of serotonin and that is the connection that actually kept us producing and um, harvesting and creating textiles and building shelters over the years. And I think that we need to get back to that, which is naturally rewarding um, and away from sort of the false stimuli, which um, may feel distracting and rewarding at the time, but creates a real deficit of that, that closed loop of satisfaction. Um, and, and so Mind Offline, we're, we're doing um, locally, we're working with artisans uh, like Peter Spacek, the incredible illustrator, Mary Jaffe, and then uh, Brian and Ainsley Schopfer of Grain in Amagansett, where they make uh, wooden surfboards and wooden skateboards to deliver these kits to people's homes where they can um, you know, work on painting a ceramic vase or uh, patchwork or woodwork and get their hands on a medium that they might have um, disconnected from. Um, and what gives me hope is the, the interest in that, that many of us are already makers, but people want, want to go deeper with it or they want to come back to it because we did it as children and then were pulled away from it. I went to school in the Silicon Valley and it was all computers and that, that was the focus. Um, you know, and, and going back to the petition, another thing that really gives me hope is when given the choice, um, people generally, I think, will choose the right thing. And I think it's just been, we've been, given so many of the wrong choices and the right choice has become out of reach in many cases or um, in an age of convenience, very inconvenient. Um, and we shamed individual consumers for their use of plastics and their use of straws and their use of plastic bags. And um, yet the majority of the waste in the landfills is actually the shipping waste right now. And you know, more than 50% of the packages are being shipped by one, one group. So I, I'm hopeful that if we can make that choice accessible um, I think people will will go back to what feels right and is is deeper ingrained in their humanity and the you know the COVID um, crisis. I think many of us, many of the people that I talked to, whether they're environmental or not, felt a shift in energy that was very deep, and we felt that rewilding. You you heard it and you felt it, uh, and it there was a nostalgia there that reminded you of something that that has been amiss for the last few decades. And so I'm hopeful that we'll we'll maintain some of that even once once things open back up. That's great. That's fantastic. I'd like to um, before we open it up to questions, just ask Barley, um, you know, I'm sure you know the saying, no grit, no pearl. <laughs> and um, the idea that you know all the work that we do, it takes patience and it's going at it each day to make a difference. And and um, 
I have hope and I am an optimist. I think you're sort of born, you know, there's a certain DNA, like I am an optimist in the work that I do. And I'm just curious, uh, Barley, if you could talk about what gives you hope um, with the work that you're doing, especially, um, you know, with, with oysters and the bivalves and what you're seeing in terms of ocean uh, regeneration on the East End. Yeah, they, like I say, every year they inspire me and they, I'm in a state of awe when I see these, we, cause we create them from two cells, egg and sperm, and then grow them for the whole season. I'm not bored with it at all. It's just the fact that they, that they, every year they persist, they fertilize, they start to grow, they grow really fast. Some of them oysters. Um, and they're just really rewarding to grow. And the oyster gardening program has kind of further instilled this awe, just having these folks get involved with growing their own oysters um, and, and just getting folks that otherwise wouldn't really get in the water and nurture something, get them out there growing their oysters. They see not only the oysters that they're growing, but also all the other stuff that is attracted to, to their oyster gear. You know, there's, it's, we're, we're, it, that gear alone creates so much habitat. They're covered in grass shrimp. They're covered in what we call marine weeds, tunicates and, 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 and other things that are attracted to the gear, uh, nursery fish. So it just, it's just awesome to see this cycle repeat year after year after year, no matter what's going on out in, the, out in our world, what kind of mayhem. Uh, it just it just persists, you know. It's it, and and seeing the kids, we have a few kids involved, and we do tours with kids at our hatchery and our, and our field sites and nursery sites every year, and seeing them just get into the water and get those clam rakes into the water and see what they come up with. That's really rewarding too, because I know that they're gonna you know they're gonna go home and tell their parents, tell their brothers and sisters, and and from there hopefully you know they'll get more involved and. You know, maybe it'll maybe it'll only only click with a small percentage of them, but that's that's really all it takes. Just that experience, getting out there and, and seeing what's what's there under the water, which people not a lot of people just you know you don't, they don't stick their heads in the water and don't really know what's what's going on under there. So you know, one I don't know. Oh, Amy, are you going to ask some questions now? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. That was such an incredible conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was really hoping that there'd be a question from attendee Scuba Steve, just to give me an excuse to say <laughs> his name, but I've done it anyway. So, so. <laughs> thanks for joining Scuba Steve. <laughs> um, the first question comes from Kevin Knudsen from New Jersey to all the panelists. How does the NYDEC regulate oyster safety when grown under public docks? In New Jersey, we are not permitted to grow oysters off our docks. Would you like me to take that one? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great, very good question. And I'm, I'm sorry, New Jersey doesn't let you do that. But in New York, they have, they, New York puts out these maps of each harbor in New York. Light blue is year round certified waters that you can shellfish in. Dark blue is seasonal. And the red is off limits year round. So if you have a dock, in the light blue area, then you can most likely grow oysters off your own dock. The only problem is you have to have a dock. Um, but it, like I said, if it's in a cert, if it's in certified waters, they'll let you grow oysters off your dock. Maybe one day we'll, they'll let us just drop a mooring in certified waters. But until then, uh, you need to grow them off a, off a dock in certified waters. So that's pretty much it. Okay. Next question is really more of a comment, but I'm gonna say, cause it's so sweet from Alana Flores of Costa Mesa to Carl. She says, she doesn't have a question, but she just wants to thank you for your new book, which she will be reading aloud to her seven and 10 year old boys as their summer reading. She said, says that you are an inspiration to them. They had tickets to hear you speak at the University of California, Irvine. Her boys are, that she and her boys love the ocean and they are participating in their second abalone survey this Sunday during low tide. Thank you, Carl. That's great, really great. And I saw that you did in fact respond to her, so thank you for that. Um, she this- does have a question, by the way, Amy, it's on the chat. Oh, did she add a question? 
Cuba Steve does. Oh, I know. I saw that. that I'm All getting right. to that. All I'm right, getting Steve. to that. I, I'm doing them in order. <laughs> but I did see that Scuba Steve had a question. I'm delighted. Um, uh, so this comment and question is from Jesse Spooner of the East End uh, of Long Island to all panelists. He says, wow, this is an awesome discussion. Thank you, Susan, Nicole, John, Carl, and SAC. You're welcome. Working as an environmental educator on the East End, the efforts of the panelists all seem to be easily integrated to a wide range of ages and students. With the youth as our future leaders, what are the best ways for students to get involved in the conservation missions of the panelists? And I think Nicole actually uh, did make a note in the, in the notes about that, right? You said- Yes, yes I was holding off because Jesse's actually my husband as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if another panelist would want to want to chat, but I I can answer quickly with the note. Um, you know, I and this feeds into the theme of the conversation as well. The ripple effect. Um, you know, finding the the easiest way that's accessible for you and the skills that you have, and that um, you know, my background happened to be in communicating with audiences and, and working in messages across a digital medium as much as I, I try to get offline. I, that's where I've, I've spent a lot of my career. Um, and so I went to change.org and anyone can start a petition on that platform. Um, you can choose to uh, focus that um, on an individual. You can choose to focus it at a, an industry or a, you know, a company. Um, and then that's something that you can share within your own social group. And, um, you know, I think trying to, to word it in such a way that um, you're not polarizing and, and instead really looking for a solution that um, makes sense to to both sides, uh, you know, necessarily. And that, that's what I think worked in my case. I know that doesn't apply for every um, every issue. There's certain issues where you really do. It is very black and white. Um, but the uh, for the environmental issue, in this case, we were saying, look, we don't want to take this away from you, but we also, um, we do want a choice for those of us that are tired of bringing this uh, material into our homes and having to manage it in our waste stream. Um, and and it started with a, you know, a half an hour effort to put that up online. So while, you know, I don't, I always say get on the internet for what you need to and then get off, it, it is a great resource. Um, but for other young students um, or kids that they might be great in theater or they might be um, incredible writers or just really uh, connected to the community and other ways and can organize. I saw, you know, demonstration in Sag Harbor today that was very powerful. So, um, you know, I think it's just tapping into what, what your strengths are and, and then going for it. And if you're not successful the first time, go for it again or, or change your approach a little bit and don't give up. I think there are lots of little things that people decide to do every day. And I, I think, you know, with these environmental issues, it seems big and it seems overwhelming, but um, everybody can do something. So just at whatever stage or whatever age you are, just think about what thing you might do and then try to get close to people who are doing that thing. And you, you can find groups online you can go on field trips, you can enroll in classes, but also just in people's private lives. Um, you know, think about what you will eat. Think about if you're old enough, think about who you will vote for. Think about what you'll drive, what groups you'll join. Um, if, if you're an older person and you have enough money to invest, what, what is it that you're investing in? What difference can it make one way or another? What, think about what you'll talk about with strangers or with people online, uh, you know, there's there's an ability now to make your voice heard that was not true when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you had to try to write a letter to the editor of the newspaper. You know, now everybody can have uh, their Facebook page or their website or or whatever. Think about what you will throw away. What what is your approach to garbage and and recycling? Um, look look ahead if you're young. Th what kind of a living do you want to try to be involved in? And what kind of education or experiences does it take to do that? And just think what kind of person do you want to be and, and start being that person? So there's plenty of things to do. I think one of the good things, one of the good things that come out of COVID is that a whole lot of people are learning how to cook. You know, maybe they'll, yeah. cook more at home and which is better for us for the body and better for 
the waste stream. On the other hand, there could be an enhanced takeout culture, but we'll, we'll <laughs> see where that goes. But I think, you know, the, between the family time and, and folks learning how to cook and maybe getting back to basics and growing more at home, that's, that's better in the long run on so many fronts, I think. Yeah, I just agree with, I agree with what everybody's saying. I think it's all about our choices really matter. And these next generation stewards will have incredible skills and ability. And I think um, one of the most important things that you, that the youth can think about is that us older folks are happy to mentor. And, um, and, you know, so I think that, you know, ask and, and seek the help that you want and question and, you know, all that will help you get to where you need to go. And I'd also say to follow most of all, like, you know, where your passions and your curiosity takes you. And out of that, whatever you're doing, there can be a lens of environmental literacy and you can make a difference. But I really think at the end of the day, you know, it, I mean, it's exactly what Carl said too, like your vote counts, <laughs> the choices you make every day, um, you know, sign that petition and think about the food you vote three times a day, if you're lucky with what you put in your mouth. And um, there's just so many ways that we can make a difference. So every action has got a political ramification. Definitely. Okay, thank you guys. Next question is from Sophia Ameva Mao to Carl. Mr. Safina, do you think we have already reached a tipping point when talking about wildlife preservation? We've reached so many tipping points for so long. I don't really believe in tipping points anymore. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that's been lost. There's a lot that is degraded, but there is an awful lot that can be saved, protected, restored. When I was in my mid teens, I was a, a bird of prey fanatic. I just, I loved hawks and um, I, and I didn't have a lot of experience actually seeing real ones in the wild. And I was reading about uh, an incredible bird called the osprey and another incredible bird called the peregrine falcon, the fastest living thing. And what I was reading about them was that they were going extinct, that peregrine falcons, in fact, in the New York Times Magazine, there was an article when I was a teenager called Death comes to the peregrine falcon. It was, um, it was a, a foregone conclusion that they would be no more. There were essentially no ospreys left on most of the East Coast. Uh, uh, the, the problem with, with all of these birds was that their eggs were breaking because of the kinds of pesticides that were used at the time. So um, the adults were starting to all die off. There had been no young ones for quite a few years. And it was a horrible situation. And I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm born too late. Um, but other people didn't think of it that way. Other people, they had that kind of hope I talked about where they understood what could be done. And so some people set about to get those pesticides banned so that the environment would clean up enough that if those birds existed, those eggs would not be breaking. Other people started raising the peregrine falcon in captivity from some of the few remaining wild pairs, mostly that they had to go to Alaska to find. There were people on Long Island who were getting osprey eggs from birds in the Chesapeake Bay, bringing them to the few remaining survivors on Long Island, giving them eggs that were strong enough to hatch just so some ospreys would grow up on Long Island and come back to Long Island. Now, I thought that those birds were going to be gone completely, but now we have, uh, let's see, I think we have one, two, three, four, five, six osprey nests within a mile of where I'm talking to you. They're everywhere now, they've really recovered. And in the last few years, their food has recovered. Uh, the fish called menhaden are here now in incredible schools that didn't exist for most of my life because we finally uh, initiated some good management on that fish. So yeah, tipping points, bad and good I've seen during my life. Um, and that's why I don't really believe in tipping points too much. Um, what I believe is try to be creative, devote yourself to what the solution could be. 
And uh, I've seen that work and it's, it's been amazing the, the changes in some of those things. Uh, and, and to just end with the Peregrine Falcon, when I was in college, my, my first professional job with wildlife was to bring captive raised peregrine falcons to a place on the coast of New Jersey and take care of them until they learned to fly and, and to hunt for themselves. So I was part of the very initial reintroduction of those birds. And now New York City is believed to have the densest nesting population of peregrine falcons anywhere in the world. They nest on the bridges, they nest on some of the buildings, they have plenty of pigeons and starlings to eat in the city. So, you know, when I was a teenager, I could not believe that these birds were going to be wiped out. And I could never have imagined that at this stage of my life, I would be talking to you about how incredibly abundant they are. But that didn't happen by accident. It happened because a few people did what was necessary. Thank you, Karin. Um, only going to have time for a couple more questions. I know a lot of you are now putting questions in the Q&A and comments fields, but I promise we will get all of these questions to the panelists and they will all be mailed out. Um, the questions and responses will be emailed out to everybody who has attended this evening. So your questions will be answered. They just won't be answered live. Um, next up is from Scuba Steve to Barley. <laughs> uh, uh, Barley, have you seen a change in water quality over the years? Uh, well, firstly, here on the on the on the east 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 end, we're kind of lucky because we have a lot of flushing from the ocean. So our our water quality out here is generally quite good, but generally speaking, um, harmful algae blooms, which is kind of the how we judge our water quality, seem to have gone down a bit recently, and I think it's partly because of uh, our attention to septic systems and just our attention to maybe fertil less fertilizer. Um, barring, you know, barring what happened with the bay scallop last season, I think generally the water quality has gotten better. And I remain hopeful that it will continue now that, you know, more people are aware of how their septic systems and their fertilizers affect water quality. Uh, septic is, is the, the, biggest producer of excess nitrogen to our waterways. So that would be changing out those septic systems and installing innovative alternative septic systems would probably have the, the biggest effect. And I think we're on, on, on the way to that. So I remain hopeful that that uptick in water quality will continue. Thanks, Barley. Um, one final question live from uh, our friend Irene Tully of Hampton Bays, I know. Barley, you know her, who doesn't know Irene? Um, her question, uh, well, she had two, but I'm just gonna ask one. Uh, the other one will go to email. <laughs> this is for Carl, and I think everyone will find this interesting. Um, how long before young sperm whales learn to dive down to get squid? Is it when they wean? I feel like how I asked that. <laughs> oh, well, that's, a, that's not exactly a simple question because how long they nurse varies from family to family. And that's another cultural thing. In some of the sperm whale families, only the mother nurses and some, anybody with a baby will nurse any baby. In, in at least one family, uh, a whale that was never known to give birth was nursing the most recent baby. Um, in another family, the most incredible thing is that one of the young ones got tangled up in fishing gear and was having a very hard time swimming and keeping up with the family. That one I think was just old enough to have started diving. It, it was weaned and um, it was hunting for itself, but w after it got tangled up, it, it couldn't dive and it was having a lot of trouble keeping up. The mother started lactating again and started nursing it again. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, generally when they're around, I believe, uh, four years old or so, they start to make those dives. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for a, a, a very short and, and sweet response to uh, a, a big question. Um, Susan, is there anything you want to say before we uh, bring it to a close or anybody else want to say anything before we wrap it up? 
You know, I just want to say I am so honored to be the moderator, and I just I I love the energy. I love the ripple effect that gives us all hope. Um, you know, some of the takeaways, thinking about sort of the importance of education, but also action. Um, and I'd say to the community that's listening, like, buy Carl Safina's books. They're incredible. And go uh, go to, you know, Nicole's mindoffline.org and, and, and relish and honor the creativity that's in all of us. And and eat more oysters, you know, like less on the less, you know, tuna and those that are higher up on the food chain. And and also I just am very grateful to the Southampton Arts Center for all the work that you're doing to sort of amplify hope and bring community together. And I wish I could be there this summer. I'll we'll be coming back in the fall, but we're in Maine and staying sheltered here. But um, I just applaud all the work that you're all doing and I'm honored to know you as my, as friends and colleagues. So thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of this panel and to know each of you. So it's been a great, great hour. Thank you. I have to point out that Scuba Steve just asked if you grow, co grow kosher oysters. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> that would be amazing if yeah. that were possible. But I, sadly, for those of you who understand the laws of kashrut, not possible. I don't think so. <laughs> Unless somehow they no longer feed from the bottom. I guess that's maybe how you do it. Yeah. Um, Anyone else want to say anything before we go or I'll just, um, no. All right. Well, thank Thanks you very much all. for having thank, me. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you all for thank doing this. Honor. Susan, thank you for moderating. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for joining. Um, uh, this has been fun to do this um, virtually. Hopefully we will all be back together very soon. Um, we're hoping actually sooner rather than later. So um, at least for our gallery. So please do keep an eye out for that. Um, we do hope to be reopening soon in stages, so so check it out. Uh, you should all be on our mailing list because you're here, but um, if you're not, please join at southamptonartcenter.org. Follow us on um, social media at Southampton Art Center. I'll send everybody else's um, links and uh, tags and all of that in a follow-up email along with them answers to everybody else's questions. But um, again, thank you all for, for joining us tonight and to the panelists and Susan again. Thank you and everybody stay safe and happy and healthy and we will see you all soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. And happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs>